Hi there, I'm Lana Smith, one of the program managers at the Leslie Science and Nature Center. I also get to work at the Ann Arbor Hands-On Museum, which really means I get to teach folks like you all about the wondrous world of science. For this year's Top of the Park, we'll be taking you through an inside look at some of the wildlife we can find right here on our planet. We'll have the opportunity to look at some live animals up close, and we'll make sure we talk about not only where they live, but how they can survive out into the wild. Then at the very end, we want to share with you an activity you can do with nature right at home. Who knows what kind of discoveries you can find right outside your window, in your neighborhood, or a nearby park. The possibilities are endless. Here at the Leslie Science and Nature Center, we house many different wildlife, both native and non-native to Michigan. Much of the wildlife you'll meet today have some sort of injury or are unable to be released into the wild. However, these animals have gone through a lot of training and are now teachers for folks like you. With their help, we can learn about how we humans can better observe and interact with the diverse wildlife we have and find out in nature, plants and animals alike. Our first animal group is going to fall within the invertebrate category. Really, what that means is that these animals don't have a spine. You can even find your backbone here on the back. You are in a different animal category. It doesn't mean these animals don't have any bones. They just have different materials or skeletons usually found in different places on their body. They have really unique anatomy. Here, let's go ahead and take a closer look. The first animal group we're going to talk about are insects. How can I tell it's an insect? Well, first thing I notice are these two little structures popping out in front of its head, moving around. We call those the antennae, or antenna, if you're just looking at one. Those have little hairs on them that help this animal sense its environment via its sense of touch and even to pick up chemical cues. But insects also have six legs. You can find them while you watch this insect walk. And three main body parts, a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. The other thing you might notice as this insect sits in the light is that it's very shiny. That's because you're looking at this animal's exoskeleton. And while the bones are made out of chitin, a different material than ours, as this animal grows, it molts out of its old exoskeleton and grows new, bigger bones. The kind of insect I have, though, is unique because it's not native here to Michigan. This is what we call a Madagascar hissing cockroach, and the name tells you where it lives, in a tropical place off of the island of Madagascar. That's why it's allowed to be able to get to be so big, doesn't have to worry about seasons. And these guys have a really unique role in the ecosystem they live in. These guys are classified as nature's cleanup crew, mostly because their primary diet is dead stuff, dead plants or organic matter. But what they do is they'll eat most of the things other animals don't want to eat, and then they can transfer those nutrients from that organic matter back into the soil, almost like an earthworm too, or better yet, kind of like a nature's recycling program. Now, these cockroaches have an interesting way of protecting themselves because they are really great food or prey items to a lot of other creatures. And as you notice, this insect doesn't have any wings and it's not super fast. But that word hissing gives you insight into just how it works. On this animal's abdomen, there are little black dots that look like it's just part of its camouflage. But those dots are actually holes within this animal's exoskeleton. When this insect feels nervous or threatened, what it will do is it'll push air using its muscles in its abdomen through these holes and it'll create an incredibly loud noise, Ooh, almost like a snake or a cat. But that's because this insect is trying to convince its predators that it's a ginormous, scary creature, when in fact it's just a tiny cockroach. And since that's its primary way to defend itself, it may do it multiple times, and they're incredibly loud when they do. But because there's so much variety in the world of insects, we had to share with you a native species too. And that's this guy right here, our largest moth we have in the state of Michigan. 
This is called a Cecropia moth, and I have the adult in my hand. This time of year is the time when we start to see these adults emerge from their cocoons after overwintering in them as a pupa. They spend most of their lives in their cocoon, going through the process of metamorphosis, where they transform or change shape from a caterpillar to an adult. Now, if you see one of these guys in the wild as an adult, that's a real special treat because they only live as an adult for about seven to ten days. They don't even have any mouths, but that's because the sole purpose for these guys once they're an adult is to mate and lay eggs to help continue to send down different traits through generations of these moths. Like I said in the beginning, they spend most of their life as a pupa in a cocoon. And throughout the summer, once they hatch, these caterpillars turn a really unique green, red, and yellow color and take on a variety of woodland plants, including maple, birch, or walnut trees too. Males too can be described as having these large antennae that can help catch the pheromones or chemical cues the females give off. That way they can mate in time since they only live for a short amount of time. Their coloration is also phenomenal, which is why so many people are attracted to finding these adults this time of year. Next in our invertebrate category, we're gonna investigate arachnids. Now in my hand, I have a kind of spider we call a tarantula or specifically a Mexican red knee tarantula. Scorpions are also included in this arachnid category and ticks and mites. Now I have a larger spider in my hand though so we can understand why those creatures are classified as arachnids and not something else because they're a bit different in insects when it comes to their anatomy. First, it's worth noting that we don't have any tarantulas here in Michigan. We don't have the appropriate habitats and it's far too cold in our winter seasons to be able to sustain a spider of this size. And tarantulas are considered the largest within the spider family, at least when it comes to how big they can be. Now we can tell she's a spider because she has eight legs, different from the six with insects, two main body parts, but like insects, she does have an exoskeleton on the outside of her body. However, you're probably noticing this tarantula is very, very hairy. Well, that's because she can use these hairs almost like the antennae of an insect. These hairs help to pick up vibrations and can help her sense the world around her. They're also used to defend herself for these hairs aren't soft. Now, I know not everybody is a fan of spiders, and that's okay. One of the reasons we bring her to show you is so we can learn just how important spiders are in the ecosystems around us. Spiders here in Michigan are one of the prime predators to insects, particularly around our human habitats. For example, they'll prey on things such as mosquitoes or insects that eat our food and plants in our garden. There are even people that put spiders in their kitchen on purpose to get rid of ants or fruit flies that are coming in and eating our food. But how do they eat? That's the unique thing. Because spiders only have two teeth. They in fact these two little bumps in the front of her face. They're fangs as we usually call them. But that means they can't actually chew their food. So what spiders use instead is something we call venom. All spiders have it. Without it though, they'd starve. And what they do is they inject the venom into their food, mostly insects, and kind of turn it into a smoothie, or more that they have to liquefy their food in order to eat it. Now, some spiders will use webs in order to catch their food and save it for later. This kind of tarantula though, called a Mexican red knee tarantula, is known to be an ambush predator, more of a sit and wait kind of animal, waiting for her food to come close enough to her. She'll build her web in layers on top of a log or leaf litter, and then she'll sit underneath and wait. She'll wait to feel vibrations of an insect on her web, pop up, grab it right then and there, and eat it right on the spot, not even saving it for later in her web. Invertebrates are really cool, don't get me wrong, but we have a whole bunch more of animal groups to discuss and other animals to meet up close. So let's shift gears here over to the vertebrate category. Animals? just like us, that have a backbone or a spine. And the first animal group we'll explore within the vertebrates are amphibians. 
In fact, here in Michigan, we have a whole arrangement of amphibians, including those like salamanders, or toads, like this Eastern American toad, or ginormous bullfrogs like this guy. But that word amphibian means something interesting. It means both lives. That's because we usually find amphibians both in a terrestrial, land, or aquatic water habitat. And it all has to deal with their survival tactics and their life cycle. The amphibian I have in my hand is a tiger salamander, our largest terrestrial salamander, meaning that when it's an adult, it can go on to land. It develops lungs. But amphibians go through a cycle we call metamorphosis, where they actually start in the water as a tadpole and can only breathe water using gills. But over time, they may grow legs, keep or lose their tail, develop lungs, and then be able to occupy different terrestrial habitats. But that's why they need to be by water. It's where they lay their eggs. And you're also noting this has really sleek, wet skin. Well, that's because salamanders and other amphibians drink and absorb things through their skin, kind of like slurping it up like a sponge. You may also notice, though, that when I'm holding this amphibian, I'm wearing gloves, and it's not really because of the stuff on his skin, it's what's on mine. See, we humans, we have oils in our skin that help us keep our skin soft and smooth. We also just touch or hold a lot of objects. We get toothpaste and soap on our fingers and more. Well, all of the material on my hand can also soak into this animal's skin and make him sick. So whenever I handle amphibians, I'm always wearing gloves, not to make sure my hands don't get dirty, but so that I make sure not to make this animal sick. When it comes to how these predators hunt, it gets kind of funky. Just because of how they eat their food, they don't have two teeth like our tarantula did, they have to swallow their food whole. And we can usually think of things like frogs or toads, even salamanders that may try to catch things with their tongue and bring it back into their mouths. But what if I told you some amphibians actually use their eyes to help swallow their food? Here, I'll show you. Let's use our Eastern American toad as an example. Toads have to see their food move in order to eat it. So we're gonna use an animal we call a mealworm, it's a baby beetle. Now when this toad grabs and swallows its food whole, watch its eyes closely because they actually push their eyes down their throat and it looks like their eyes magically disappear. Don't worry, they pop right back up in the same spot, watch. Wicked cool, isn't it? Think you have an idea of what the next animal group is yet? Well, let's see if we can show you some examples. Sometimes this animal group looks like this. It has a shell that covers most of their body. Or maybe it's an animal that looks like this. Or maybe it's an animal like this. We're talking about reptiles, some amazing ectothermic creatures we find all over this planet. There are thousands of reptile species out there. Also means there's a lot of variety and a lot of exceptions when it comes to their classification. Now, here in Michigan, we have a lot of turtles and snake species, but we don't have a lot of native lizards. Maybe one or two species we could consider to be native here. And therefore, starting with lizards is unique because it gives us a really cool inside look into the lizard world and how we can best identify them. The lizard I have in my hand is an Australian species called a blue-tongued skink, although many people may recognize them because they're in the pet trade, even though it's now illegal to take them out of the wild to be sold as pets. And blue-tongued skinks have a unique adaptation where their tongue is this light blue tint, usually used to intimidate other predators or animals coming nearby into tricking them into thinking she's poisonous, when in fact they're not. But lizards themselves have some unique features, different from other reptiles, that help us best identify them. First, lizards have an ear opening, or an ear hole, running along the side of their face. While we would assume that most animals would have some way of hearing, we'd know that not all reptiles have an actual ear opening. The other thing, too, that they have are eyelids. At least most of them do. The line around their eye you can see, to be able to blink and clean and clear their eyes, just like you and I. 
Beyond having legs or a unique body shape too that we can sometimes use when classifying other reptiles, then we can look at the diversity of lizards specifically. Blue tongued skinks, for example, are a burrowing species. We can tell because of the shape of her face. It's in the shape of a triangle, almost like a shovel. She can use that to push sandy soil out of the way in order for her to hide or better yet, to get cool on a hot desert day. She also has a really flat body that she can use to expand or contract in order to fit into smaller spaces like under rocks. But we could spend hours talking about lizards just because there's so many of them. So let's move on to our other reptile categories, at least the kind of reptiles we can also find here in Michigan. Now, snakes are one of my favorite kinds of animals. I just find the variety and how they're able to adapt incredibly fascinating, especially when they're hibernating or brewmating, as we call it, with reptiles. The snake that I have in my hand is an eastern fox snake, a native resident here in Michigan, although like our box turtle, not very common. Many of the threats that we find with native reptiles here happen to deal with something called habitat degradation, or meaning they're losing the essential habitat they need to survive. Some species are more picky about the resources that they have to have in a habitat. This guy is another one that requires wetland or aquatic spaces, like either a smaller pond, river, stream, creek, and more. But from there, we, with human development, and with losing some really pristine, clean wetland spaces, there's just not as much habitat that they need in order to survive. Also, a lot of people think that eastern fox snakes look like rattlesnakes. We can sometimes make people afraid of this kind of snake. However, you can see right now on his tail, there's no rattle there. Just the coloration might look similar. We only have one kind of rattlesnake here in Michigan. Now, eastern fox snakes, though, do have some other cool adaptations. For example, they're amazing climbers and swimmers, but are often known to eat small rodents or amphibians, sometimes even crayfish or fish if they can find them in their aquatic habitats. And even though they're not considered constrictors like boas or pythons, they are seen to be able to use their body to squeeze or constrict their prey before they eat it just like that of a boa or a python too. Now, this is a boa constrictor. You can already tell based on the fact of how it's holding onto my arm, almost as if I was a tree branch, squeezing it in order to balance. And boa constrictors usually look a little more on the chunky end, just because they're chock full of muscle power. But that's what allows them to asphyxiate or squeeze their prey. However, one thing I'm noticing with a lot of our snakes, including our boa constrictor, is how tiny its head is. This is a boa constrictor called a rainbow boa. It typically has an iridescent or rainbow-esque sheen along its scales. Great camouflage for if you're in a rainforest or jungle habitat. But this animal can prey on things like bats, larger snakes, or even birds. So how can it fit something like that in its mouth? Well, snakes' mouths are very stretchy. It's not that they can dislocate their jaw, it's more that they are able to open and stretch their mouth out and around larger food items. And thanks to all the muscles that they have in their body, they can slowly work that food down their throat throughout their body to easily digest it over time. Now, if you've ever been to a festival with the Leslie Science and Nature Center, you'll almost always meet this guy. He's a veteran teacher and animal ambassador from our center. And he's helping us with one of those animal categories, birds. We here in Michigan and really all over the world have a great diversity when it comes to different types of birds. And the birds that are housed at the Leslie Science and Nature Center are raptors or birds of prey. These hunters or apex predators that we find in many different habitats. Now the kind of raptor I have in my glove is a barred owl, B-A-R-R-E-D, known for the bars or the stripes that run down his belly. That's his tree camouflage. And owls possess a lot of unique adaptations because of their nocturnal lifestyle. Just because you're nocturnal doesn't mean you can't be awake during the day, just means you're typically most active, or that's when you hunt or look for your food resources. And one of the first things people notice with owls are just how ginormous their eyes are. That's because owls, they rely on their eyesight to catch small amounts of light from something like the moon or the stars in order to be able to see tiny details at night. 
but their eyes are so big, they're stuck inside their head. This is why we see owls having this robotic nature, where they're able to turn their heads in all kinds of funky directions, about 270 degrees. That's because they physically cannot move their eyes. They have to move their head in order to see. Now, these guys, as raptors, they also possess these two main features that help them hunt. One are these sharp toenails we call talons. And all raptors have four sharp curved talons. It's their primary hunting device. Even the word raptor means to grab. But their feet are also very powerful too. Raptors possess incredible grip strengths, sometimes reaching up to 500 pounds per square inch, where they can break or crush the bones of their food just by using their toes. That's how powerful they are. The other adaptation or feature we see is on their face, and that's their beak. We know we can usually identify what a bird eats based on the shape or size of its beak. Well, for owls and other raptors, they have a curved, sharp beak to kind of act like a knife and fork combo with their talons, cutting their food up into smaller bits in order to swallow it whole. These guys don't have any teeth, so they can't chew up their food. They have to rely on the shape and size of their beak to pick apart their primary prey. Now, possums, raccoons, deer, and more are great, but we couldn't talk about mammals and not mention bats. I mean, they make up 20% of all mammal species out there, over 1,200 species of bats on our planet, which means there's a lot of diversity, but all the bats we hear about actually play a very important job in the ecosystems we find them in. Bats are the only mammal that can fly. Actually, the scientific word for bat means hand wing, and that's because they're flying with the same hand and finger bones we have. They just have skin membrane in between, and their hands are the size of their body, being able to help carry them as they move about in the air. Bats are also nocturnal. They possess a lot of great senses, including their eyesight, these cone-shaped ears to take in sound, and a really great sense of smell to be able to look for things like fruit or other prey items. Now, the kind of bat I have is not native to Michigan. This is called a straw-colored fruit bat. It's an African species, and its role is that of a seed disperser. It takes seeds from the fruit it eats, migrates or travels, and then deposits them back onto the ground, either by going to the bathroom or spitting them out. But their waste, or guano, actually has a lot of great nutrients for plants to grow. Therefore, it's kind of spreading fruit force around its own habitat. Many of us have also heard of bats being amazing echolocators, using sound to find food or other resources like shelter. Now, the bat in my hand doesn't echolocate, doesn't need to. Its food doesn't go anywhere. It's a fruit eater. However, many of the bats that live in Michigan are echolocators, and they rely on that sound just because their eyes are so small that they don't rely on their eyesight to navigate in the dark. They rely on echolocating. And then to help us conclude our mammal group, we brought one of the most common types of mammals, rodents. I have a domesticated rat with me in my hand, and while many people see these guys as pets, these guys are great representatives of their wild counterparts because we learn a lot about our human senses and what's called our physiology, how our internal structures work by studying these guys, just because we have a lot of similarities. For example, with humans, we usually talk about our five main senses, our sight, our ability to hear, to smell, to taste, to touch. But from there, their senses, while they have the same five too, work slightly differently. A rat's best sense would be its sense of smell. Not only because it can pick out things that it can and cannot eat just by smelling it first. These guys are scavengers, so eating a lot of dead decaying things tend to smell differently. And they're able to figure out when something is just too rotten by smelling it. They also can smell early signs of certain diseases, like tuberculosis or certain forms of cancers. Heck, even right now, this rat can smell what's on my shoes or what I had for breakfast. That's because they have so many more genes dedicated to their sense of smell versus any of their other senses. Sure, they have their whiskers for their ability to touch what's around them, and yeah, they have larger eyes and ears that work fairly well as a nocturnal creature, but it's their smell that's key.
These guys too have a lot of the same mammal characteristics, having fur on their bodies, raising their young, giving milk to their babies, and having live birth. Most mammals don't lay eggs. The other cool thing though is that because we humans learn so much about us from rats, we actually study these guys and can use them for human benefits. There's even larger rats out there that are being trained to learn how to sniff out landmines before humans step on them. So we develop really cool relationships with some of these animals too. Plus they're just fun to watch, being an amazing climber and having all these cool mammal features. Now that we've had the chance to go through all of our animal groups, it's time for us to start with our next activity. What's something you can do at home to learn more about nature or the wildlife around you? Let's check it out. The craft that we're going to do today is making flower crowns out of a beautiful yet highly invasive species we call dames rockets. You find these just about everywhere. And cleaning up and getting them out of your neighborhoods or wooded spaces is a great way to make sure there's lots of space for other native flowering plants to occupy their habitats. Now, when you pull Dame's Rocket for this craft, you want to make sure you get all of the roots. Don't leave any fragments behind. Otherwise, it'll just re-sprout. And when we're done with today's activity, you want to make sure that you throw this away rather than tossing it back out in nature or composting it. Otherwise, the seeds will continue to disperse and it'll be harder to get rid of in order to make more room for native plants. First, I'm gonna take the flowering part of my dame's rocket and I'll make sure that I can fit the circumference of my head. I've actually cut a little bit of it off to make sure that I don't have too much of the roots. You can also collect multiple dame's rocket stalks to make different colors, since you usually find them in purples and whites. Now that I've gotten and measured a couple different stalks of our dame's rocket, I'm going to start twisting them together to form a circular crown that matches the size of my head. Once you've created a circular shape with your dame's rocket stalk, you can either connect it by twisting the ends together, tying them in a knot, or using something like a tape or twist tie. You'll also want to dent parts of your stalk so that it stays in the circular shape. From there, then you can take the flowering stems and twist them around the main stalk. This way they stay closer to your crown and also stay connected. From there, then you can start adding new colors or extra Dame's Rocket stalks, depending on how thick you want your crown to be, how many leaves you want connected, and what kind of colors you choose. You can also just cut off the flowering stems of other Dame's Rocket plants to be able to add any color, texture, or other creations to your crown. And voila! You have your very own Dame's Rocket crown. You can keep adding more flowers, different stalks, different size, shapes, and more to be able to have your own temporary creation as you go out and explore the wilderness and pull more Dames Rocket. Thanks again, guys, for joining our presentation for our Top of the Park event this year. We hope not only that you learned something, but that you had a good time exploring the wildlife we met up close and learning how to create cool crafts and other activities that we can find right outside in nature. Feel free to reach out if you have any questions or thoughts about today's virtual program or more about how you can explore nature around you. Thanks again, scientists, and happy exploring out there.